Hi everyone, my name is Angela Boldini. I'm a cognitive scientist specialized in memory and learning. This is the first of a series of videos in which we look at the main cognitive capacities involved in the process of learning, i.e. attention and memory. Let's start with attention. Okay. So what are we talking about when we talk about attention? What does to pay attention actually mean in cognitive terms? We usually associate the concept of attention to ideas like focusing or concentrating on something. And this is absolutely correct. But there's more to that from a cognitive point of view. The first cognitive models of attention appeared back in the 50s and the majority of them saw attention as a sort of selective filter, meaning that, according to those models, only part of all the information that we have in and around us will be selected as interesting and will go through the attention filter. The rest will be discarded. Of course, this basic idea is correct, but let's go more into details. What I would like to introduce here is the Postman's model of attention. This model presented by Michael Posner back in the early 90s has succeeded in explaining coherently a good deal of data and phenomena and is therefore one of the most widely accepted model models today. Posner sees attention as a modular system consisting of three integrated neural networks. The first one is the alerting network. This is a basic attention network, a sort of vigilance systems that maintains the optimal state of alert at any given time and according to circumstances. This is the network that tells us, for example, if everything is all right around us or not. It's the network that manages the resetting or reshaping of our attention in case, for example, of a sudden alarm. The second network is the orienting network. This network, uh, this system determines where to direct our attention in space, what to focus on amongst the hundreds of stimuli that we, are all, that we always have around us. And if the orientic network chooses where to direct our attention, the third network, the executive attention network, basically decides what to do, what operation to carry out, how to do it, what to give priority to and what to ignore. The executive attention system is therefore a very busy system and a very demanding one in terms of cognitive energy. It's like an executive control unit in charge of execution and control of every single conscious task that we perform. That's why it's often metaphorically seen and presented as our brain switching board. This metaphor makes sense. It makes sense because each and every moment our brain has to choose which concepts to activate, which concepts are necessary to operate. Other incoming information, other con concepts, which we consider as an important or disturbing noise for the time being will be inhibited. Some information will be amplified in our brain, some other will be minimized and so on. An example that I often use and that can help us understand the executive attention system's crucial role is the brain of a bilingual person. If I speak more than one language very well, as many of you probably do, I will often have many competitors in my mind while I speak because to express the same concept, I'll have more than one term that comes to mind and that I could potentially use. I will therefore have to inhibit the terms and words that I'm not interested in using and activate those that I need, given the person I'm talking to, for example, or given the circumstances I'm dealing with. The executive attention network in this case is therefore in charge of spotting the potential problem of using one term or another, inhibiting the less appropriate terms of war or words, choose or activate the most suitable words in my long-term memory and use them. Obviously, this is just a very simple example, but I think it's useful for you to understand all the work that, exec that the executive attention system has to carry out and to understand why this is actually the most energy consuming unit, let's call it like this, in our attention system. So when we are mentally tired, when we cannot think straight anymore, when we are so tired that we find it harder to speak a second language compared to our usual standards, it's because our executive attention system is tired, not the other two systems, the vigilance and orienting ones, just this one. 
These are the brain areas associated to each of the three independent systems. As you can see, the executive attention system, here indicated by purple circles, is associated with the prefrontal cortex, which is where the hard work happens, let's say, in cognition. Another thing I need to add is that our, attention, is that our attentional system receives inputs from both what we call the top-down and bottom-up stimuli. What do we mean with this? Top-down stimuli are basically internal stimuli, mainly our thoughts. Those things, positive, negative or neutral, that our brain is elaborating and seems unable to stop thinking about, especially if you are trying to concentrate on something else. Bottom-up stimuli are all the internal, the external, sorry, it's stimuli that we are surrounded by. People claiming our attention, for example, noises, voices, things happening in general, pets, phones. I haven't got the time here to talk about what our phones are doing to our attention system, but I'm sure most of you are very well aware of it. Of course, our attention system is also in charge of finding a balance between top-down and bottom-up stimuli, in charge of deciding what is important and what is not, what to attend to and what to give priority to. So what do we need attention for? Is attention really necessary? Of course it is, you might say, but why exactly? Let's look at, look at another example here. Imagine being in a crowded situation a street, a station, an airport, and having to take a taxi, for example, or a train or a flight. You have thousands of stimuli around you, people, information, signs, lights, sounds, noises of all sorts. Now imagine, if you can, not being able to focus on what you want and need, and having to process all and every input around you in parallel at the same time. Would you ever get your flight, your train, or your taxi? No, you wouldn't. Nobody would. We wouldn't be able to move a single step forward, probably. So that's the first reason why attention is necessary. To avoid saturation of information and to function properly. The light bulb is another very common metaphorical image associated to attentional processes, by the way. But this is not just a matter of saving cognitive resources. Attention is biologically necessary for learning. What do I mean with that? What we commonly call learning in neurobiological terms is called long-term potentiation, which is a neurobiological process that basically consists of an increase in synaptic activity between neurons. For this increase to be given, mental focus is needed, especially if we are talking about conscious and voluntary learning, because it's only through the mental focus that the neural activity associated with the stimulus I'm focusing on will amplify and project into the prefrontal cortex and generate, generate long-term potentiation. No wonder, therefore, that Wickens and Holland found experimental evidence confirming that when we eventually retrieve information that was processed without interruption as a, as a primary task, we are likely to experience only minimal errors. But when we retrieve information that was processed via multitasking or with significant interruptions from a secondary task, we are more likely to experience some form of performance decrement. So what's the teacher's job here? The teacher's job is to pay attention to attention which means to make sure that students' attention is on the main message, the main issue, the main point we want to make sure it's delivered. How do we do this? Here are some useful questions that you might ask yourself. Do I make clear to my students what I really want them to focus on? What's the important point? Do I ask them questions? one of the best way to, stimula to stimulate attention. Do I take into account attention spans limits? How, how do I do that? Okay, I have to leave it there for now, but to conclude, I invite you to make now a brief mental recap of everything I've just told you about attention. Take some notes if you want, and only once you're finished, Replay this video if you need to check your notes and get some feedback. 
this is one of the best ways to start the consolidation process of the new information that your brain just registered. Okay, that's all for me now. And I'll see you in the next video.